Hello, my name is Eric Williamson. I'm the current president for the Society of Cardiovascular CT, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the 2022 SCCT Asia Pacific Symposium. We're gonna start things off for you today with a Siemens Spotlight. Again, it's my pleasure to introduce an old friend of mine, Dr. Bernhard Schmidt, who is the Director of CT Pre-Development and Innovations for Siemens Health and Ears. Bernhardt's going to be speaking to us tonight about cardiac imaging with photon counting CT, virtual calcium-free imaging, and other innovations. Bernhardt? So thank you very much for this nice introduction. Welcome from my side. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and get the opportunity to present about cardiac imaging with photon counting CT. So what I've planned for the next 25 minutes is I first would like to review where are we as of today in the case of high-end uh, cardiac CT imaging and then thereafter introduce this new technique of photon counting CT. On the one hand side, from a technical side, what is the background, how does it work, what are the opportunities from a technical side, but then also demonstrate and clinical examples, what are the unique capabilities and what can be done with such a CT system which cannot be done with a traditional CT system. What we see here are the two key components of a CT system. On the one hand side, we have the X-ray tube. On the other side, we have the CT detector. Let me start with the X-ray tube. And here we had seen substantial improvements over the last few years. What we see on the right hand side are the challenges and limitation of a conventional X-ray tube. So as we go to lower KV levels, uh, we see that we are kind of limited with the amount of MA that we can deliver. This is unfortunate because due to that fact, the benefit and the potential of saving radiation dose by going to low KV is in the end limited to small and pediatric patients. This limitation had been overcome with the introduction of the Vectron tube. It's a tube that allows you to deliver 1,300 MA in the case of 70 and 80 KV. In the end, in the case of a dual source, twice as much, so 2,600 MA, which enabled in the end the use of low KV scanning even for larger and more obese patients. An example of that one is shown here on the right hand side. Obese patient here scanned in the past never would have been possible with ADKV. So the ability was utilized here to save radiation dose. And this saving of radiation dose was combined with a substantial reduction of contrast media. So here only 30 milliliter of contrast media had been injected into the patient. When we look into the detector side in the area of energy integrating detectors, also here, substantial improvements over the last few years. When we'll see on the left-hand side, conventional detector design, this is our sensitive area. Here, however, lots of analog parts, substantially improved with the integrated detector in 2011. And finally then, the fully integrated design in the year 2014. What are the two key benefits of this fully integrated design? We see it on the left hand side. On the one hand side, substantial reduction of electronic noise leading to less noise in your images. Here demonstrated on this phantom scan where we can see in the case of a fully graded detector, substantially less image noise. The other big advantage shown on the right hand side here, the ability to end up with a sharper um, with sharper images, with sharper delineation of structures. We see here a comparison of a coronary stent previous technology versus the fully integrated design. And we see that the level of sharpness is substantially higher in the case of the fully integrated design compared to that one, what we had in the previous technology. Now, however, when we look into the future and if you want to really expand the level of resolution, if you want to go to even higher resolution levels, if you want to end up with even more reduction of radiation dose. And if we have the wish of always having functional information available, then we see with current energy integrating detector technology, which is what we have in all of our CT systems as of today, with that one, we cannot accomplish that one. And the solution for that one is the introduction of quantum counting detectors. Now, before I come to the principle of the quantum counting detector, let me very briefly review how do we measure today X-ray quanta in the case of a conventional energy integrating detector? The left-hand side shows the setup of such a, a detector. It's a two-step approach. So the X-rays are coming in, they're interacting with the scintillator material. Here, the energy of the X-ray quanta is converted into visible light. 
And then we have a photodiode which measures the light, it accumulates the signal and provides an electrical current which is proportional to the intensity of the incoming signal. This technique, however, has two main challenges and limitations. First of all, the energy information is lost because we are only measuring a secondary process. So when we measure the light, it's unknown if the light had been generated by a low or high energy quanta. And secondly, also the energy weighting is unfortunate. So high energy quanta causing more light, contributing more to the signal than low energy quanta, which is, as I said, unfortunate because the low energy quanta, as we have seen on the previous slide, are the ones carrying the information. The situation is different in the case of a photon counting detector. We see again a schematic drawing on the left hand side. So we have here a direct measuring principle. We have here as a semiconductor cadmium telluride and we have a cathode and an anode whereas between both there is a high voltage leading to a strong electric field. When now the photons are interacting with the material, they directly interact, they are generating electron hole pills the electrons, the generated ones, are forced due to the electric field towards the pixelated anode where they are causing an analyst pulse. And this generated energy pulse, which is measured separately for each of the quanta, the height of this pulse is proportional to the energy of the incoming quanta. Therefore, we have here several benefits and opportunities. We count each of the quanta separately and we know the energy of each interacting quanta. Therefore, we are always able to perform spectral processing. There is no downweighting of low energy quanta because each of them causes a pulse. So they are equally weighted. And the nice thing is only pulses above a certain threshold are counted, meaning there's no traditional electronic noise. Now let me go a little bit more in detail. How do we derive the spectral information? So thousands of photons are interacting and hitting the detector. Here now we only see the interaction of five different photons with five different energy levels. As I mentioned, the energy, the pulse height is proportional to the energy of the interacting quanta. What we then have in addition to that, we work with thresholds in our electronics. And depending now if a certain peak is exceeding a threshold, the photon is counted and considered for the low, the medium, the high, or the highest energy bin information. Doing so after one scan, we do not have only one picture at one energy level. No, we have in this case four pictures of four different energy levels, which can be used for any kind of spectral processing. What can be done with the data? This is demonstrated here. Patient with a partly calcified cyst here, 120 kV, acquired with 120 kV, we see a 70 kV image representing a conventional CT. What you then always can do for any kind of data is you can calculate a virtual non-contrast image where with an algorithm the iodine had been removed. You can calculate an iodine picture with which will provide you with a pure iodine distribution in the quantitative fashion. And what you see on the left hand side, you can always calculate monoenergetic images, which is by the way the traditional and normal output of such a counting system. And here you can go to a low value, for example, to 45 keV, which demonstrates a substantially increased iodine CNR. And the iodine CNR is in the level of a low keV scanning, making low keV scanning obsolete because you can do this virtually from and based on the 120 keV data by calculating, for example, 45 or 55 keV. Another big benefit of photon counting detectors is they can go to high resolution without any dose penalties. This is a side view of an energy integrating detector. We see the detection is done by this scintillated material highlighted here in yellow. We have, however, since an optical detection principle, also some dead zones which are not sensitive to X-rays. If you want to go to high resolution, we have to cut this scintillator material in even smaller pieces as it's indicated here. As you see already on the left-hand side, we are losing the material that translates the interacting quanta into the light, so which compromises substantially our dose efficiency. In the case of a photon counting detector, we do not need this optical separation. Separation is done here by the electric field caused and generated by the high voltage. So here, if you want to go to a higher resolution, we simply have to make the pixelation of the anode smaller and smaller 
In doing so, we are able to go to a high resolution without compromising those efficiency of our CT detector. Again, visualized on the right hand side, this is now the top view at a conventional detector. We see here brighter, these are the dead zones. If you want to go to a higher resolution, we have to cut this one into even smaller pieces, have to fill it up. And as you see, less of less of the sensitive material, the scintillated material is left, compromising the efficiency of the detector. Situation is different in the case of a photon counter, because here you just make, as I said, the anode smaller pixelated. In doing so, you can go to a higher resolution without compromising dose efficiency of your CT detector. The capabilities are shown here, a comparison to a conventional CT scan. On the right hand side, you see the results of a photon counter. Here, images of the smallest bone that we have in our body, the stapes. We see on the left hand side a picture. We see here the situation, 0.4 millimeter slice in the case of a conventional CT. Barely visible the structure here. If we go to the photon counting CT here, substantially better visualization of this super tiny structure. The distance between those two legs is 1.2 millimeters, so you can imagine how small the structures are that we see here on the rest inside. At the bottom, here another structure visualized the cochlea. Again, a comparison between a conventional CT in the middle and the counting CT here on the right hand side. Again, demonstration of how much more we can accomplish with this high resolution of such a photon counting CT system. Looking into the heart, also here a very nice result from phantom experiments. We see on the left hand side the picture of that stand of a coronary stand. Here the result of an energy integrating detector, right hand side of a photon counting detector. You see this substantially increase in resolution, the ability to see the structure of the stand much, much, much better as you can do it in the case of the energy integrating detector. The nice thing with the photon counting detector is you can combine the topic of high resolution with the topic of being always spectrosensitive. And this is demonstrated here on a patient with a huge adenocarcinoma sitting next to the heart. As you see on the left hand side, we have here the high resolution reconstruction on the left hand side. But then what we always can do is we can derive and utilize the spectral information as it's shown in the middle. As I said, the typical output are monoenergetic images, in this case 190. Uh, KEV, but then interactively you can go to lower energy levels, in this case to 45 KEV, and all of a sudden you are able to improve substantially the contents in the data you see with structures to uptake which amount of iodine. In addition to that, you also can calculate pure iodine pictures representing the blood volume information. Again, here even more easier possible which amount of iodine you have in which area. And for example, in the case of an incidental finding, as in this one, you just draw an ROI and can measure directly how much milligram iodine you have. For example, in this case, there's no iodine uptake, so most probably just assist that we have in that area of the body. What are summarized the uh, properties and the benefits of a photon counting CT detector? We see, as I mentioned it, we have intrinsically always uh, the spectral sensitivity, so we can derive always spectral data. We always have the ability to go to a high resolution, as it's indicated here. The two other key properties and benefits are we have no electronic noise, it's indicated here at the bottom because we only count what is above a certain threshold, so no traditional electronic noise. And last but not least, we have no downweighting of low energy quanta. They simply equally contribute to the signal and do not have this unfortunate weighting of traditional energy integrating detectors, as is shown at the bottom also, where the high energy quanta contributes substantially more to the signal than the low energy quanta. Now, the development of photon counting CT is something that is ongoing with Siemens since um, almost 20 years. It started in the year 2003, as you see it here on that screen on the left hand side, first images, still some artifacts. And finally, in the year 2003, we accomplished to achieve uh, clinical image quality. In the year 2012, a very important step, we bought the company Accurat which is able to, and which has this uh, detector material, which is absolutely quiet, this cadmium telluride. A few years later, installation of first prototypes here, the first one, in fact, at the Mayo Clinic, uh, others installed at the NIH and at the German Cancer Center, a second generation in the year 2019, and then finally in the year 2021, uh, the 510K clearance with an absolutely impressive uh, announcement here that the FDA cleared first major imaging device in advance for computer tomography in nearly a decade, so really indicating what kind of a mistake he really had been accomplished by the introduction of photon counting CT.
The system that I'm talking about is the Neotom Alpha, and I do not want to go too much into detail here, but it's a dual source system um, with the traditional benefits of dual source scanning. So we are able to uh, generate images with a temporal resolution of 66 milliseconds, independent of the heart rate. We are able to acquire in high pitch scanning mode, meaning more than 70 centimeters per second to acquire our data. And the system is equipped with two of those quantum technology um, quantum counting detectors allowing you to go to higher resolution and also adding always spectral information available. Um, and we have a high end resolution or depending on the clinic application that you are looking into. Um, as I mentioned, um, at any scan, you are able to derive those spectral information. And this is just an example from that here, a nice example provided by the guys in Monaco um, acquisition. In dual source mode, we see on the left-hand side a central view here, a traditional image here with 70 keV representing what you had in the case of 120 keV scan. And very similar to the case that I've shown previously, you are always able to calculate uh, virtual non-contrast images. So with the algorithm, remove the iodine from the data set. We are able to derive iodine pictures, as you see on the right-hand side. And you always can go to lower monoenergetic levels, which allows you to substantially increase the iodine contrast, as it's nicely indicated in that case. Here, another example here, patient with a dissection, um, again, a dual source scan with 66 milliseconds temporal resolution for all of those images, so also the monoenergetic and also the iodine pictures. Here, nicely illustrated, if you go from 70 keV to lower energy levels, as in this case, to so the 45 keV, substantial increase in iodine CNR, uh, as it's uh, visible here on the right-hand side. And if you decide to just do your assessment on the pure iodine pictures, this is also possible, as you see it at the very right-hand side. But the visualization of the VRT and also the side view is just based on a pure iron picture. Looking a little bit more into the topic of high resolution, seeing kind of the unseen, here an example from outside of the heart, uh, but from my perspective, very nice visualization here of this Wiener stand. You see the small, tiny structures acquisition had been performed with a 0.2 millimeter collimation, and you are able to see the small details here in the brain visualized in an extremely nice way. Very nice example from the guys in Zurich that provided uh, us with this case. Now switching over to the heart, also here high resolution imaging is possible with a slice thickness of 0.2 millimeter. As you can see on this case here, very challenging patient, heart rate ranging from 55 to 120. Um, you see the ECG at the right bottom. It was a systolic with an absolute milliseconds delay and acquisition. Extremely challenging patient, algorithmic, but I think extremely good image quality. On the left-hand side, how you would perform a normal reconstruction on the right hand side, the UHR reconstruction. They are nicely able to see much, much better than in the case of a traditional reconstruction that you're able to see inside of the vessel next to the calcifications and so on and see the small, tiny structures much, much, much better than in the case of the standard reconstruction. Here, another case, again, acquisition with a resolution a slice thickness of 0.2 millimeter, again, dual source with 66 milliseconds temporal resolution. On the left-hand side, you nicely might appreciate the benefit of going really to the 0.2 millimeter slices. So we are able to see those small calcifications here substantially sharper and better than in the case of the 0.4 millimeter. So absolutely impressive, sharp details here being visible on the right hand, after the left hand side. Here in the middle, a CPR, also here the small tiny structure and vessel very nicely being visualized on the right hand side. You see a VRT, also here all the tiny small branches excellently visualized here with a temporal resolution of 66 milliseconds. Since we now have always spectral data available for any kind of scanning, it also opens up to solve maybe one of the last remaining challenges in CT, which is the topic of calcium viewing. That the topic of calcium viewing is in particular a problem for the assessment of coronary arteries has been very nicely demonstrated also in the work that we see at the left bottom side. We see that the main reason why coronary arteries cannot be diagnosed is because of the presence of calcium. The challenge again is shown here in the middle. So the same stenosis acquired and looked at at two different energy levels. And as you see in the two pictures, it's absolutely impossible to determine in a reliable way, in the case of the presence of lots amount of calcium, what is our stenosis level. What you see on the right hand side by just using an HU threshold to get rid of the calcium is also not a solution because the remaining lumen that we see on the right hand side might be very questionable and might not represent 
what is actually left as a true lumen. Therefore, we are proposing the use of spectral data and the spectral removal of calcium to have a better view of the remaining lumen. And herefore, we introduced a new algorithm. We call it pure lumen algorithm. It's utilizing spectral information to get rid of the calcium. So we have to do a modification to the additional um, decomposition, material decomposition that we do in the case of spectral data. What is shown on the left-hand side is the additional way of doing that. So we typically work with a high and low energy information. We perform material decomposition into a soft tissue picture and an iodine picture. If you do that, however, you see that the calcium is still remaining in your data set because, and unfortunately, it's neither the one material into which you decompose, so the soft tissue, and also not the other material, which is the iodine. Therefore, the calcium in the coronary artery ends up in both images, the soft tissue picture and the iodine picture. However, you can solve that problem by modifying the spectral decomposition, and you have to go from an iodine soft tissue decomposition into a decomposition where you have on one hand side a pure calcium picture, and on the other side, you have an iodine soft tissue picture. If you do so, the decomposition is shown on the right hand side, you end up with a picture that is shown here highlighted in red. It is just representing the soft tissue and the iodine components in one picture and the other picture just containing the calcium. In doing so, you are able to get rid of the calcium by utilizing spectral information. The opportunities are shown on this case. Dual source scan, 66 milliseconds of all the different uh, data that we see here. We see here uh, the calcification sitting next to the coronary artery. We can also zoom in and uh, see, and we can highlight it and detect the amount of calcium here with spectral methods. And then we also, with the proposed algorithm, are able to remove the calcium from the vessel. On the right-hand side, you also see the CPRs. We nicely can see and appreciate the ability to get rid of the calcium, as you can see it very nicely in the right-hand side. Here's another example on the left-hand side. Uh, a CDA of the heart, the picture on the left-hand side, demonstrating here, provided by the guys at MUC, that you're able here to see lots of calcium in the data set, but then with the algorithm, you're able to remove uh, the calcifications from the data set and have a pure look at the lumen. Maybe even more impressive, the case here on the right-hand side, it's a patient with heavy calcifications here in the aorta. In fact, there's also a stent in that area after the application and after removal of the calcium using spectral techniques here, you have a pure look at the remaining lumen. Interestingly, luckily also in this case, well, not only the calcium had been removed, but also the stent had been removed, and still you are able to see what is the remaining lumen, which is impossible to be seen, what we see on the left-hand side. Now, another application possible with spectral data being always available is the quantification of ECV, the extracellular volume. We see here results of ECV derived from single energy CT scanning in the case of TAVI patients, with the goal to identify cardiac amylite. Comparison was made against scintigraphy. The results at the left bottom side indicate a very good correlation between established grading and the results derived from the CT-based ECV. The question is now, what can we do better or different with photon counting CT? What we see here on that slide is the protocol that had been used for the study shown on the previous screen. We see there's necessary a baseline scan, a CTA scan, and a late enhancement scan. On the right-hand side, you also see how ECV in this approach is calculated. So beside the hematocrit value, we also need the enhancement values in the myocardium and in the blood. And therefore, the information from the late enhancement scan is used, whereas the baseline information is subtracted. Now, in the case of a photon counting CT, the baseline scan is necessary. We directly can extract the iron information from the late enhancement scan and are able to avoid the extra radiation dose from the baseline scan. And we also avoid further post-processing by performing a registration. The result of such a scan is shown here with a goal for EZV imaging. We see here data from an example from uh, Dr. Schwartz from Augsburg, uh, left inside the BRT. Then we have here in a polar map fashion in a quantitative way, the ECV information displayed here. On the right-hand side, in the anatomical fashion here, the CT-based ECV 
for comparison purposes on the right hand side the results of the MR scan, the late enhancement scan. And we see also here this excellent correlation between the information from the quantitative ECV CT scan and on the other side from the late enhancement MR scan. Now, the technique itself also had been further investigated in a feasibility study here by the hospital in Zurich. In between, it's also published. The goal of that study was to compare the single energy approach to determine ECV versus the spectral approach, where we simply do not use and utilize the baseline scan. The results are for 30 patients with severe aortic stenosis undergoing a photon counting CT scan. At the left-hand side, you see the blunt altman plot, and on the y-axis, you see the ECV. On the one hand side, derived from the spectral approach versus the single energy approach. And as you nicely can see, an extremely good correlation. The authors concluded accurate ECV quantification is possible directly utilizing photon counting CT. And secondly, also lower dose compared to single energy CT approach simply because the pre scan scan um, can be avoided. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, I have to say, Bernhard, this is a fantastic talk, as always. Very impressive stuff you guys are working on. It's really exciting to see the future of CT really taking shape. I had one question that I had for you, a little bit of a technical question. I, I think I remember that you mentioned that you guys use cadmium telluride as a detector material. We've heard that there are other groups using different materials like silicon and things like that. Why did you choose this particular material for, for this scanner? So thanks, uh, Eric. Excellent question. So um, in general, they, you need a semiconductor. And in the end, there are, of course, difference. There are, so on one hand side, the cadmium telluride. An alternative one would be the silicon. The key benefit of the cadmium telluride over the silicon is that it consists of uh, higher atomic numbers. And uh, this result in basically two benefits. Because of the higher atomic number, the detector material itself can be thinner. It can be in the range of VDF today, also in the case of a detector material. So if you look into a traditional CT detector, also here we're talking about whatever, two, three, four millimeters of thickness. And uh, if you would go to another material like silicon, we would talk about whatever, five, six, or whatever centimeters of thickness, which would be a challenge from the manufacturing perspective. In addition to that, also the high Z material, so the high atomic number leads to the fact that typically the photons are interacting with the photo effect. The photo effect has this nice advantage that you typically deposit everything where the interaction is happening. In the case of a silicon, you have more the effect of the Compton effect. So the spreaded and the scattered um, quanta, they fly around in the detector, also compromising resolution. That's the reason why, in the end, the cadmium telluride is um, the more efficient choice. Isn't that interesting? OK, no, yeah, I had no idea. So there is actually almost an attribute because of the difference in between the photoelectric and the Compton effect. There, there, really, there should be a real difference in, in resolution then resulting from that. It's uh, it's uh, in a different. It's more efficient when the the interaction is happening. So okay. imagine similar to um, if you inject iodine. It's also mm -hmm. a high atomic number material, and here you typically have the photo effect. The photo effect makes the uh, the X rays to interact immediately, and Dob is depositing all the energy, and that in the end um, is of benefit from a detector perspective. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I'm always amazed when we get to have these conversations about the stuff that you guys are doing and working on. Okay, so Thanks. you opened it up there. I'm gonna the addition, next question I have for you is, you know, new new revolutions or new evolutions in CT happen periodically, right? This is a, a huge leap forward in the in the fundamental way that we do CT. What do you see as the killer app? specific to cardiac imaging? What's, what's the reason that people are going to want to buy this CT scan and at least have, have it uh, available to them in their practice? Yeah. So I think I, I showed a few applications that, that, oh, that would be possible, for example. Yeah? And uh, I showed, for example, also the extracellular volume uh, stuff. But in the end, from my perspective, really, the key benefit and the reason why this, such a system should be used is to still be able to assess even heavily calcified coronary arteries. I think, yeah. and uh, to address that question uh, would go into two directions. On the one hand side, of course, the ability to go to a high resolution to see even smaller structures in an even better way. And this mm. in the end combined 
with the, uh, we call it pure lumen. So the ability to remove the calcium from the data set. Uh, and of course we have to see how well that one works. But I think if, if in the end it turns out that even in a case of extremely calcified vessels where normally you cannot say anything, where you have to say you have to go to the cast, if you would be able to make those assessments still at a high resolution, I think this would be really the thing where I say this will bring cardiac CT even uh, a step forward, a yeah, substantial step yeah. forward. Yeah, no, it's it's exciting stuff for sure. And you probably mentioned it as a part of your um, your talk, but how many of these systems have been rolled out so far? So uh, where we're coming from, we had all those prototype installations, uh, but uh, the, the, uh, the, the rollout, I would say, had started in Europe um, mid of last year. Uh, mm -hmm. End of uh, last year, there was the approval from, uh, the five, uh, from the FDA. And now we are talking about uh, 30 more systems uh, that are already installed up and running. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm guessing also most of you have seen already the first publications there in the scientific journals about the, the Neotom Alpha. Yeah, congratulations. That's super cool. That's great stuff, Bernhard. I think we're running up against time, but uh, as always, uh, exciting stuff that you guys have going on. It's good to see Thanks you. Thanks very man. much.